All right, Nick Troiano, thanks for doing this. Hey, pleasure to be here. You're executive, thanks for the lift. Yeah, you're executive <laughs> director of the Centris Project. And before we talk about the Centris Project, tell me how you yourself got into politics, and I'll, I, won't, I won't lie to you, I remember you. You ran for the House of Representatives for a congressional seat when you were 24. I did. And I had to look up, is he eligible to run? <laughs> You have to be 25 by the time that you're sworn in, so I think I just made the cut. You would have made the cut. <laughs> All right, and you ran in Pennsylvania's 10th district. Uh, tell, tell, t so what happened? Sure. Uh, well, I got involved in politics a decade ago uh, when I came to D.C. as a student and got involved in an organization called Unity 08, which imagined holding an online convention for a bipartisan ticket for president and vice president. And while that didn't quite uh, work out, uh, it got me thinking about creative ways to bridge the growing partisan divide in our country, which has only grown larger ever since. Uh, while in D.C., I got very involved in fiscal and budget issues. Uh, after the Bull Simpson Commission put forward their report, Bipartisan Ideas of How to Deal with Our Debt, I started a group called the Can Kicks Back to try in, and... In college. Uh, in college, yep. Yeah. And, and after college. What and, made you bipartisan when so many Americans are separating and careening to the to the wings of each party. Well, uh, my mentor in politics was a guy named Doug Bailey, and he uh, instilled well. in me in the value that politics is really about public service. It's not a zero-sum game of which team wins. And, what a quaint idea. And through that perspective, <laughs> when you see the big problems facing our country, you realize that in order to solve them, we need to be able to come together and work together, just like we do in every other aspect of our lives. So, so this was a natural thing to you, to run for Congress as an independent, maybe... Right. Well, yeah, I was motivated to run after the government shutdown in 2013. Interesting. Uh, it became clear to me that, uh, as someone who cares most about the federal budget and national debt, that not only is our country broke, but our political system is broken. And until we change the incentives of people in office, we're never going to be able to deal with the large challenges we face. So that's why I ran as an independent. I didn't fit in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. and. Moreover, if I was elected to office, I wanted to be able to represent the people and not either of these factions or the special interests that fund them. All right, you finished third in that race. You, you got a little over 12.5%. Not bad for a 24-year-old kid who had no money. <laughs> um, what, but, but you did finish third. You didn't win. Um, what did you learn? What did that tell you about What did it tell you about the political system, about what needs to change in order for independence to actually become viable? around the country? Well, first, the only thing that both parties agree on is to make it difficult for anyone else to compete against them. So they've rigged the rules in their own favor from how to get on the ballot to how much money you can raise. Uh, and there are other obstacles, including the political industrial complex that has built itself around both parties who can work on campaigns uh, from a talent perspective, your campaign managers, your vendors. So there are many obstacles I learned in running, uh, but there's also tremendous opportunity out there. There are a plurality of Americans who are now independents, uh, people who want... Well, I'm independent. You're telling me it's not just me, you, and Angus King? <laughs> no. <laughs> and Most... Greg Orman? Right. Uh, in fact, over the last 10 years, independent registration has grown by 30%, and, and both parties are in the single digits of growth. So I think I know this, but so it's what, what's the percentage now that you operate on that people refuse to identify with either party and or consider themselves actual independents. It's about 40%, okay. and it's much larger among people under 40. Really? Uh, and moreover... So you guys could save the world, yeah. <laughs> well, I think the future of politics is not confined to brand A and brand B. I mean, my generation has grown up surrounded by choice and competition, and the idea that we have to pick between the lesser of two evils in elections is quite foreign to us. So you can get... 15 different kinds of smartphones, but only two political parties. Exactly. I think there's a better way. We, we have to choose from Blockbuster and Barnes & Noble, and uh, I think <laughs> in the future we're going to find a better way to do politics. All right, so all right, so, so let, well, let's talk then about the Centrist Project uh, and, and, and the, fulcrum, the Fulcrum Strategy. That's, yep. a, that's a kind of a, as a John LeGuerre sort of feel to it, the Fulcrum Strategy. Is this a secret plan to take over the government? <laughs> well, the, the Fulcrum Strategy and the Centrist Project is a way of hacking the two-party system. Okay. And what I mean by that is we found a leverage point by which we can disrupt the two-party duopoly and actually provide some representation to people who don't feel at home on either side. And what that means is we're working to build the infrastructure to recruit and elect a slate of three to five independent centrist senators. And United why that's, States senators. United States senators. And why that's important is those 
three to five senators could control the balance of power in the United States Senate. If they're elected, neither party would have a majority and therefore they would be able to swing their votes on an issue by issue basis to either side and then force both sides back to the center to find some common ground on our big problems. Are you and I were talking about this yesterday, but for people who aren't familiar with this, let's 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 walk people through it. So let's say you you elected an independent senator, give me a state, Wyoming? Say Utah. Utah. All right, how about uh, Alaska? Mm-hmm. Alaska, is that doable? Uh, Alaska has an independent governor right now. All right, Alaska and Wyoming, can, and look, should we throw in a Democratic state there? Sure, let's choose New Jersey. New Jersey, all right, so that's three. Let's say that, let's say you were able to do that uh, in 2000, what, next year? Yep, 18. 2018. All right, then, um, We've already got Angus King there, so we have four. Uh, who among them, and I think I know him because he's from West Virginia, and I kind of like him, but who do you have in mind that you could sort of get to join your new movement? Well, right now... In the Senate. Who are, are there three or four that might join? Yeah, well, we think not only right now in the current breakup of breakdown of the Senate, we just need to get three independents in there. All that right, balance but, of power well, might let's, shift. Let's, let's not cut it too fine. Let's let's go for five or six. Sure. If we want so to grow the those, caucus. Yeah, those three that we just said, yep. plus Angus King of Maine, who's already an independent, yep. uh, can you get a couple more? We think so. Uh, you know, we think Joe Manchin, for example, from West Virginia, Ben Sass from Nebraska. They're both independent okay. leaders so in the United States. That's one from States each Senate. party. So yep. now we've got, what was that? Now we've got six. And... So who's going to be the majority leader? Well, in that scenario, in that scenario, when they vote, those six will decide who it will be, okay. and it will be someone who will govern the Senate not as it's currently governed in a hyperpartisan fashion, but someone who can govern the Senate in a way that actually brings people together, the way that committees are assigned, the way that the rules are operated. Um, that's so the leverage that this group can have. So the, the fulcrum strategy is the two parties are so polarized, but so so evenly divided that if you can win three or four states you can you can you can run the country absolutely and this has been done on a state legislative level ah uh, you're going to bring up jason grin yeah all right jason grin yeah i'm writing about this this week and but i'm so i'm going to scoop myself but that's okay <laughs> tell our listeners about jason grin because that is a story i hadn't heard till yesterday well jason grin uh is in his mid-30s he's worked for a nonprofit. His wife and a couple kids. Not much older than you. Not much older than I am. <laughs> uh, also, like me, concerned about the budget deficit. Except the budget deficit he's concerned about is in the state of Alaska. Okay. And uh, what, what town does he live? He's from Anchorage. Okay. And the legislature adjourned last session without dealing with the budget deficit. Democrats didn't want to budge on spending. Republicans didn't want to budge on taxes. Jason tried to find an independent to run in his district against the Republican incumbent. Couldn't find anyone and decided to run himself. So they had a government shutdown of sorts, their equivalent. And he said, well, all right, nobody else is going to do this. So he had no experience in politics. No experience in politics. He, you know, was involved in his community. He cares about the future of his state and decided... What is, and what did he do for a living? Uh, he worked for a nonprofit organization. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Okay. And so he decides to run in June of 2016 and spends the next five months knocking 5,000 doors in his district. 5,000 uh, doors? Five, yep. So he outworked the uh, Republican and the Democrat. Yep. And he won. And he did it while working, while, uh, you know, before putting his kids to sleep on the weekends, and he won by a couple hundred votes on election day. But the most extraordinary part is that Jason and, and another independent who was reelected that same cycle uh, formed a new coalition in the Alaska State House. They formed a coalition with three moderate Republicans and switched the balance of power in the Alaska State House from all Republican control for the last 30 years to now a new bipartisan governing majority. And uh, Jason has become the youngest and first freshman legislator to be appointed to the Budget Committee where he's now working on the issue that motivated him to run in the first place. What's so interesting about that is that when Greg Gorman, we, we mentioned earlier, when he ran for the Senate in Kansas, this is the scenario he had. He had this idea that this could happen. Right. And it's happened, but in, in a state, a state pretty far, a small state, a state far away, idiosyncratic state, but still right. it's happened. Yep. So, so you think it could happen here? They call the Alaska the last frontier state, but it's the first frontier for independence. They have an independent governor, they have two in the legislature, 
the wave of independence is already beginning to come from the states, and it's going to arrive at Washington uh, before long. There's a couple independents in the main state house. There's a couple incumbent in, uh, senators, state senators, who switched their party from Republican and or Democrat to independent. So there's a movement already building out there that not many people know about, but it uh, foreshadows what can happen at a federal level because people have had it with both parties. Well, more we're going to know about it now because we're doing, this is a very popular <laughs> program, Changing Lanes. Um, Nick, let me ask you another let me play devil. I'm a reporter, so let me play devil's advocate. Sure. Um, I, I, I'm from California, where you're living now. You live in my home state, of, my hometown of San Francisco. But the great assembly speaker, Jess Sunra, used to say, money is the mother's milk of politics. And it's a lot easier to raise money now than it used to be with the, with online, with the Internet. But still, you to get these, to get these independent candidates in these states you would face uh, an avalanche of money from the parties, especially if they got wind of what was going on. And, stuff. And, and, and especially if the Republican Democratic Campaign Committee and the Republican Senate Campaign Committee got in mind, oh my God, this could happen. Uh, they'd start spending a lot of money. How are you going to match that? Because you do need money to run political campaigns. What's your idea of how your candidates could could stand up to the onslaught of money that would come be spent against you? Well. We think when there is a slate of independent candidates running nationally, it can catalyze a national movement of people who'd be willing to pitch into those campaigns. Because regardless if you're from a state where an independent senator is running, you're going to benefit from having a few independents in the Senate who can break through the gridlock and dysfunction. So we're already building that grassroots movement now at the Centrist Project. And in fact, through our current campaign called Hack the Senate, uh, people have already begun to crowdfund a super PAC uh, to help make sure the resources are there for our candidates. And so we're, we're going to have large dollar support. We're also going to have a bunch of small dollar support. And as you said, in this age of the Internet, there's no reason why the people uh, couldn't be more powerful than these two old parties. And that's what we're going to demonstrate. Are you thinking that it would help you to have centrist candidates who can self-fund? We do. Uh, we are looking to run candidates who can win races. We're not looking to make a bunch of noise like the Greens or Libertarians. We're looking to win because that's how we're going to make a difference. And so we're looking for people that have some name ID in the states that they're running, people who have resources, uh, or a network that can help them access both. Hey, I'll give you one. How about Howard Schultz in Washington State? Howard Schultz uh, is a potential candidate who's very much aligned with what we think politics ought to be like in terms of leaders coming together to solve problems. Uh, former Senator Chuck Hagel in Nebraska is another potential candidate that we'd like to see run. I knew Hagel from his old days at the VA in the Reagan administration. He's yeah. a very much independent. He's, in fact, he's served in Republican and Democratic administrations. Right. What these potential candidates need to know is that if they step forward, there's going to be a support mechanism from for them. No one wants to maybe besides me, run a kamikaze independent <laughs> campaign for Congress. Uh, so that's what the Centrist Project is focused on. You know, we don't consider ourselves a, as a traditional third party. We're America's first unparty. We're building the infrastructure necessary to help these candidates win their campaigns without building a third party that carries the bureaucracy and costs.